World Government Summit 2017. Dialogue session by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, UAE Vice President, Prime Minister and Ruler of Dubai. It gives me great pleasure to welcome His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President, Prime Minister and Ruler of Dubai to the floor to commence the dialogue on how to resume our civilization in the Arab world. Please join me, Your Highness. May God grant your health. Your Highness, we'll start the dialogue right away and we'll try our best to concentrate on the questions. Since we've received thousands of questions through social media platforms, the press and interested parties across the Arab world, after this dialogue was announced. First of all, it gives me pleasure to welcome you and thank you for your attendance. Secondly, we'll discuss reigniting the civilization in our region. I have a formula for that, which I've reached through my personal experience in leadership and management. That is my formula, and each one of you has his or her own. Re-establishing our civilization requires hard work. It needs thousands of teams from each country to rise up and collaborate. But we'll start with a vision in the hope that the others will follow. We attempted to combine many questions in one question, so we can try to answer these queries, which we received from the UAE and other countries. 
We saw these shocking numbers in the Arab world earlier in the video, but you've achieved great numbers here in the UAE. What do you aim to achieve out of this dialogue? Or more specifically, why are you preoccupied with the Arab world and reigniting civilization in the Arab region? Praise be to Allah. First, I'd like to thank you and thank the audience and everyone who interacted with us in this meeting and dialogue. I, 12 years ago, I sent a straightforward and honest message to Arab leaders, in which I stated, change or you will be changed. Some people blamed me, some were upset. Some were told, what does he know about the future? That's true, only God knows the unseen. But there are indicators that can help us understand our situation. First of all, Arab leaders have surrounded themselves with officials and entourages that tell them that everything is excellent and great. They tell them that, that people are happy. I know that Arab leaders listen to their entourages and believe them. However, there are indicators that happiness is absent, contentment is absent, there are lost opportunities, a backward economy, there are millions of educated Arab youth who have no hope for the future. Today, we're talking about reigniting our civilization. And this requires effort from all of us. But each one of us can add his own formula. This brings me to the question, through our observations of the news in our turbulent surroundings. In all honesty, Your Highness, are you optimistic about the future of the region? This region is the cradle of major human civilizations. So, inevitably, there is hope. If I had no hope, I wouldn't have wasted my time, the respected audience's time, and that of those who interacted with us. I am optimistic. A human being is still a human being. Humans are the ones who create civilizations, economies and wealth. If they built a civilization, they can reignite it and bring it back. I have big hopes that Arabs have the foundation to reignite their civilization. Your Highness, what do you think the Arab world lacks in order to resume this civilization and drive it forward? Honestly, we in the Arab world have an education population. We have wealth, water, and rivers, mountains, hills, and arable land. We have everything, and in addition, we have willpower. But this willpower 
تريد يعني بصفة شيء واحد management. وهو الإدارة الإدارة management is important مهمة. إدارة management of governments إدارة uh, management of the economy إدارة uh, Management of manpower, infrastructure, management of all areas. It must be the main focus in everything. There is also people's management. We even fail at managing sports. I'll give you an example. Our population is about 300 million, and the U.S. population is about 300 million. Just look at how many medals the U.S. has won in the Olympics, and how many medals we have won. This means we're failing, and we need to fix it. Allow me to move to some of the questions that came on video. The next question is by Professor Farouk Al-Baz. Your Highness, you know I've observed up close the impressive achievements in Dubai and the other Emirates in the UAE since my first visit in 1974. I was also pleased to examine your personal accomplishments in this area. My question today is twofold. First, what do you think was your most important personal achievement in this significant field? Second, why do you think it was the most important achievement? Thank you. In the UAE, we've achieved many phenomenal achievements. Mohammed bin Zayed, our brothers, and myself take pride in those achievements. But the greatest achievement of them all is the human being, creating leaders from people. The human being is the one who's capable of anything. Human beings can manage economies, wealth, people. And in the UAE, people have reached the forefront. And this makes us all happy. And as for the second question, I say... The founder of the United Arab Emirates, may he rest in peace. Upon the establishment of the country, there were only 40 university graduates. Today, I can tell you that we have a program aimed at launching a mission to Mars. I'm really pleased that those working in this program are young Emiratis in their 20s. Anyone who doubts that is welcome to visit those young men and women who are making us proud. We have another question on video from Kuwait by Mr. Mohammed Al Rumehi. Your Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, good evening. I am Mohammed Al Rumehi from Kuwait. Many questions came to my mind, but I realized that most of my questions were solved in the United Arab Emirates, under your command and the wise leaders of this young state. Perhaps the question that's left is between the extreme unrest in the region, in the north and in the south, and the massive terrorist operations taking place in the region. How can Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, as Prime Minister of the UAE, 
balance between economic, touristic and cultural openness and maintaining security. I believe it's difficult to strike that balance, but there must be keys to it that can help the rest of the neighboring nations. Thank you, and I wish you the best of luck. The challenges facing the world never stop, but we have to keep growing and developing and work hard for our people and for our country. More than 40 years ago, if we decided to stop until security prevailed, we wouldn't have accomplished anything. Despite the security constraints, we have people who are keeping us safe, and they're highly capable. We keep working diligently and moving forward for the sake of our nation and our region. Your Highness, let's go back to some of the social media questions. Based on your long successful journey in governing and development, what is the best advice you can offer to the officials in Arab countries? Let me tell you, Mr. Faisal, that we don't claim to be perfect. We learn. We learn a new lesson every day. We don't waste our time. When time passes, it never comes back. It's like the water flows in the river and never returns. I say this to the audience to manage your time and work. Because we never know when our lives will end. So we keep learning. And I can say that we've succeeded. We've studied, learned, and acquired knowledge. The story of the UAE is available, and we can share it with whoever wants to learn something, hoping that it can help them. And if they have a better approach, that's a different matter. We can't say that we're perfect, but we have qualities in leadership that we can share with our Arab brothers. But many Arab leaders announce visions for the future of development in their countries. But we don't see the fulfillment we see in the Emirates. In the same way, the vision is translated. What's the secret behind that? Having a vision isn't enough. Planning is necessary. Planning allows you to forecast the future and be prepared for it. Planning is necessary. And you can't have a plan and do nothing about it. Plans must be followed by actions. In the same context, we've received questions about the same idea. Many leaders have the same vision and resolution, but the people surrounding them are always blamed. What do you think about that? I believe that leaders play a pivotal role 
Creating leaders is one of the most important things. There has to be leadership, and that it continues to do its work without hesitation. And comparing themselves to others, we work with dedication in difficult times. This is why I hope that everyone will join our path, and may God help us all. God willing. Your Highness, we go now to a video question from the Egyptian TV host Amr Adib. Let's watch it. Perhaps the main question that always comes to my mind to discuss the updating of governments and governmental work is one direct question that's always on my mind. And I hope you embrace it and try to answer it and help us with it. Does the success of governments in the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait result from the fact that they are new and wealthy states? Can this experience be replicated in older and poor countries like Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Iraq and so on? This is the question for which I am seeking an answer. Was the experience successful because it was easy, the smaller population and the larger resources? Can a government be successful in a poor country with a large population? Or does success have the same foundation in Dubai, Egypt, Iraq, Libya, Sudan and all other countries? We hear about the success, the achievements and the ability to automate management and online government where people can get their work done. Can 90 million people in Egypt get their work done on the internet, like people do in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Sharjah, Um Al Quwain, Ajman, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. This is what I hope you can help me understand. If this is possible in these old countries with limited resources and large populations, then I hope it's included in your discussions in this conference that will hopefully be successful. Thank you. It's a long question, Your Highness, but I hope it's clear. Yes, I understood the question. <laughs> Amr Adib's question is mischievous. He talked about wealthy countries, which are smaller and younger, that have the prerequisites to be developed, while countries with large population face challenges in that. I want to share an example with you. China's population is 1.3 billion. And it has the second largest economy in the world. Japan has no oil since he's saying that the Gulf states have oil. South Korea has no oil, and it's very advanced. It is not about oil. So, there are many good examples for success, but there is one result for how to fail, and you know it. He talked about Libya. It's a rich country. But it had no management. And we feel for the people of Libya. But Amr Adib, I want to tell you something. That the United Arab Emirates and its people love Egypt and the Egyptians. Egyptians even taught us when we were little.
I want to remind you, and I know that you know, this is something about the UAE and its people. I'd like to remind you that when the Arab leaders refused to have Egypt among the Arab ranks and imposed an embargo on the country, I was there at the time. When the founder of our country, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan, may he rest in peace, was the one who brought Egypt back and told the Arab leaders that Egypt had to come back because it's the soul of the Arab countries. They said they didn't want it and that the masses were with them. He told them that nobody agreed with them and that if they decided to go through with it, the UAE will be against that. And eventually, the embargo was lifted, and Sheikh Zayed was the one who returned it to the ranks of the Arab world. This is just a reminder. Yes, we have another video question from a gentleman from Iraq. Let's watch it. Peace be upon you. I am Jassim Mohammed Abdul Latif Al Niemi from Iraq. Sheikh Mohammed, peace be upon you. My question is, in order to develop the Arab and Islamic civilization in the Arab world, can religion be separated from politics? Before Islam, The tribes used to fight each other. They invaded one another. And with the advent of Islam, it established a civilization. And you all know that the Islamic civilization served the whole world. But now, those who possess very little knowledge went back to killing each other in the name of the Holy Qur'an and in the name of religion. They fight each other and blow themselves up too. In the name of religion, they carry out suicide operations in Europe and the USA in the name of religion. Their understanding of religion is wrong. This is not Islam. Islam is tolerant and loving and it brings people closer together. When Islam is described as peace for the people, it doesn't just include Muslims, but all the people on earth. Those people who think this way and want to capture women and kill men with the pretext of following the religion have a faulty understanding of this peaceful religion. Yes, Your Highness. We go back to the social media questions. This question was raised in many ways and many times, and I'll read it as it is. Do you believe in the conspiracy theory? Many people say that one of the main reasons behind the backwardness of the Arabs is the conspiracies being plotted against them since the division and occupation of their lands more than 100 years ago. What's your opinion on that? Yes, I believe there is a conspiracy.
You shouldn't think that countries do not conspire against each other or spy on each other to serve their own interests. Even when a leader plans to serve his country and people, there are people who try to sabotage his plans. So conspiracies have existed for thousands of years. If we look at history to this day and until the end of time, conspiracies will always exist. Countries will always plot against one another, even in the U.S. elections. Some countries were said to have conspired against it and interfered in their elections. And you know who they are. But a country can't say that there are conspiracies against it and stop working. This is not right. The countries that fell behind use the conspiracies as an excuse. The conspiracies will continue, but you should keep going. You have to work hard and put more effort to achieve your goal. There will always be conspiracies. Mohammed bin Zayed, his brothers, and all those who work with them move forward regardless of what is said. This only gives us more determination. We go back to the video questions, Your Highness. This question is from journalist Jihad Al Khazan. Sheikh Mohammed, I heard from a member of the UAE government over which you preside that Barack Obama didn't keep his promises to him and that Donald Trump is better than him. How do you see the future of the relations between the UAE and the USA? And what are the issues of interest to the UAE that you want to raise with President Trump? My dear brother, we build our relations with countries and governments, not with individuals. The new president had a talk with one of our members who gave him our insight. Our relations are always based on common interests the interests of both countries and the interests of our people. This is our policy. Someone may say that previous administrations in the U.S. made mistakes. I agree with that. For example, the invasion of Iraq as well as supporting Arab revolutions. How much did the U.S. lose in the war on Iraq? And how much did Iraq lose in the invasion? That was a major setback. They wanted Iraq to become a model country for the entire Arab world, which they had said before. Now it has regressed and became a bad example. Thank you. Your Highness, now we'll go back to the written questions we've received, and this is a recurring question. How does Your Highness view the role and the progress of the Gulf Cooperation Council? In the past, to be honest, its pace was slow. Yet, actually, it had excellent stance. The GCC countries took a unified stand on many issues. And their stand on the invasion of Kuwait 
and the liberation of Kuwait. The GCC took a stand and won the world support. Personally, as my brother Muhammad knows and as we say, we have today exchanged letters. And we have teams that work together. So, for this reason, and for what I know, the GCC today, under the leadership of King Salman, and all the leaders in the GCC, I believe that the GCC will continue to do well and will have an influence on the Arab nation and all Arab countries in the future. I say, and I am certain, that in the coming four years, since we know the delegations coming and going, whether from Abu Dhabi or Kuwait or the other countries, we know for certain that in the coming four years, the GCC will achieve as much as it did in the past 40 years combined. That's another recurring question, Your Highness, in the field of economy, and it says, what does Mohammed bin Rashid think about the Arab Common Market project? Why doesn't he lead the efforts to turn this dream into reality? And does Mohammed bin Rashid believe in this project to begin with? The Arab Common Market We always hear those words. It was a dream. However, today, my advice is to stop pursuing the Arab common market. It's an outdated dream. And the trade ministers, too, are still meeting, discussing and dreaming about an Arab common market. Today, we're in 2017. The world has changed. The world has changed. It has become a global common market. So, I say to them, let go of the 1970s speeches and let go of that old dream. But if you want to open up, then open up to the world. Why do you want to open up only to your neighbors when the whole world has become one common market together? There are no borders anymore. If you want an example, our airplanes, the UAE's airlines, they carry passengers from Brazil to China. We have other planes that operate in 260 airports around the world. We have tourists coming in from all around the world. Trade is open, unlike other countries where trade is closed and limited to a few countries. No, it must be open. The world requires us to be open. We import goods from China and export to Africa and South America. So, the world today has become small, so we must open up to it. If you want to isolate yourself, then it will be your loss. The market is open, and there is one common world market. Thank you.
نعم. We heard your Highness's opinion about the GCC's role, and now we'd like to hear your opinion about the Arab League. How does Mohammed bin Rashid view the Arab League and its role, and what advice do you have for the Arab League? The Arab League must unite. My advice for the Arab League is to embrace the Arab youth and their new projects and to help these youths in their endeavors and to also embrace professional experts because many young people have a lot of positivity and they have new ideas and quite frankly the Arab League must bring Arabs together in heart and to have I suggest to have a branch in the United Arab Emirates. And we we are willing for the sake of the Arab youth to offer courses and intensive training for the Shabab and give them of the expertise we have in order to make them capable of leadership and management. Your Highness, we received the following question, and I will quote it verbatim. Your Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, I'd like to ask you about a rumor of which we've heard a long time ago. What's that story about Dubai seeking to build a new capital in Libya during Gaddafi's reign, which was to include a financial center, as well as infrastructure, and why did the project stop? After Libya admitted that they had a nuclear project and sanctions were imposed on the country and after they abandoned that project it was taken over by the West and sanctions on Libya were lifted. Gaddafi called me and said Muhammad, I want to build a city like Dubai in Libya. Naturally, neither I nor my brothers could ever say no to an Arab country who asks us for something. So, of course, we sent a specialized delegation and they studied and surveyed the area. And they went outside the capital city, which was a short distance away to Gaddafi's tent, and pitched the project to him. As you said, Faisal, the project included financial districts, as well as retail markets and shopping avenues, universities, schools, and hospitals. But when the team was about to start working, conflicts broke out, the conflicts under Gaddafi. So the team started to see there was a problem and that they couldn't start working. So each person wanted a piece of the project. And they had to appease this and, and they had to appease this and that, and that was disastrous. 
Then we recalled the team. That's why the project stopped. Had it been implemented, it would have been an economic hub. Africa and for Libya, and Libya's situation today would have been better. Because when there's corruption, when there's corruption in a country, for example, in a country where there's corruption, if a project costs 100, they allocate 1,000 for it, 100 for the contractor and 900 for the officials. Your Highness, we have a question from Jordan in the same context. It's a question about corruption, so let's hear it together. I'd like to ask Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum about corruption in Arab countries. How can we get rid of it, Your Highness? When we say that an organ in the body is dysfunctional, that means it doesn't function properly. Likewise, if we have a corrupt minister, or a corrupt institution, or a corrupt person, then corruption basically means bribery. And progress was hindered in many countries due to corruption and bribery. And you can know that there is corruption in any country. How? If you drive into the airport, and the traffic officer. If there is bribery and whatnot, you will know. I've been to countries where we've seen bribery, so we didn't invest there. And the responsibility falls on the leader for seeing bribery and doing nothing about it. But in some countries, that corruption is considered a normal practice. They think that, they think that, they believe it's their natural right. But I promise you that I, Muhammad, and his brothers would never tolerate corruption in any form. Another question that I'd like to ask, Your Highness, has just occurred to me. You surprised everyone by talking about corruption and the need for change a while ago on a visit to Dubai Municipality, upon which you made major changes. Some people thought you overdid it with those changes, because some of those leaders were late to work in the morning. What's your take on this, Your Highness? Uh, that's true. Some people who heard about those changes thought I might have made a hasty decision. But I'll tell you the truth. We are responsible before our people and before God to not tolerate wrongdoings. Our brothers at the municipality and the managers there have done good things in the past. And I used to personally follow. I used to monitor through the secret shoppers. And I used to monitor through the clients. We've been monitoring for a year and a half. So sometimes we even gave them a program, or a task. A while later, they think Muhammad must have forgotten about it, and nothing happens. And the secret shoppers would report that to us. So we checked and reviewed the situation. And we were certain they reached a stage of stagnation. 
where one doesn't really care anymore. They would think, that's me, and I'm not leaving this chair. So, as you know, we all like to have some new blood. They did well. But they reached a stage of recession. Therefore, we let them retire with appreciation. We have another video question from Mr. Ali Jabber, the Group TV Director of NBC. Do you believe that the media in our Arab world today encourages unity or separation in the process of resuming our civilization? Uh, Mr. Ali, I have many friends in the media sector. I might be too honest with them today. The media in our region is what incites revolutions. Let's say we have 1,300 TV channels in the Arab countries. The cost of these channels amounts to $30 billion. What did we achieve by that? They have channels that promote sectarianism and conflicts, saying that's a Sunni and that's a Shia, while all of them are Muslims. So, Honestly, I say that they made mistakes and that they were the reason. They were the reason behind what happened in those countries. So, if we say we have these 1,300 channels, where they exchange insults and people are instigated against each other. We saw what happened and what that led to. So you must set things right in the media. Or I warn you that you will be left behind. And I warn you that the Arab people and us We'll go to the social media unless you set things right. We have another video question from Jordan, Your Highness. Yes, that's right. A video question from Jordan. Hello, my name is Anas and I'm from Jordan. I have a question for His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. What was the first idea that occurred to Your Highness when you first assumed power or when you started thinking about your vision and the phase of development through which you made Dubai? How is it now? And what were the initial steps that you thought must be taken in order to reach this stage? Thank you. The first thing I did was about excellence. We created competition between different departments. The nice thing was that the media and the people came to attend the ceremony and to honor the successful departments. When we were done with the honoring ceremony, I said I was going to announce the names of the worst five departments. And that changed the concept for the entities. And they made more progress. But I'll tell you something else. I'll tell it to the audience.
When I was asked, to join the federal government and I accepted on behalf of my brothers. Surely I have my people and my consultants who like to call themselves consultants. They said, Muhammad, we have a piece of advice for you. I asked, what is it? They said, here's our advice to you, Muhammad. God helped you succeed in Dubai. But the federal government is a routine government, and it has a lot of debts. Nobody knows when a minister might come or go. You can't do anything here. I smiled. I was thinking, so they came to me again saying the same thing. They said I have made it and I should not ruin it by going somewhere where I couldn't do anything. And that the government was in big debt and they had routine work. They would ditch work to go have lunch with their wives. But I would smile, because that was my duty. And thank God, we paid off all the debts in a short period of time. And today, we have a surplus. I wanted to tell you the story because it used to make me laugh. I'm telling you, with the help of my brothers and the ministers, some of whom we've changed. I can tell you today that the UAE government is ahead of all other governments. We have many video questions. We'll take another question from Egypt. Regarding Arab women, how does he see their progress in the Arab world? I read in a report a while ago that the percentage of working women in the Arab countries was 17%. That's unfortunate. The percentage of female university graduates is between 70 to 75%. The percentage of women in our government is something in that vicinity. Actually, it's 80%. Furthermore, we have women who are worth a thousand men. <laughs> Women are half the society. If you're working, can you breathe with only one lung? Can you walk on one leg? Can you work with one hand? We need men and we need women. If women today make up one-third of the cabinet, it pleases me to tell you that in the coming years, 50% of the cabinet will be women. Another video question, this time from journalist Turki al Dahil. My question to Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, who spends each day like all of us, he only has 24 hours a day. 
How can His Highness wake up early to start the day by exercising, riding horses and bikes, then goes to the offices to check the employees' attendance at the beginning of their shifts, and then attends meetings in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and he visits the other Emirates, checks on the projects, sponsors conferences, and finds time to sit with people on their feasts and shares their joys and sorrows. And on top of all that, he plays with his children and his grandchildren. Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, how can you stretch those 24 hours to be 84 hours? We'd like to hear the secret from you on how you stretch 24 hours to become 84 hours, Your Highness. My brother Turkey, if we, the UAE officials and people, had 84 hours, we would have built four cities like Dubai. We would have built two UAEs. I'm joking, of course. But time management is crucial. Because time goes by, and it doesn't come back. You can't stop it. It's like life. Why do I insist on learning something new every day? Because if you don't use the time, you will lose it. Time is like a river. If you don't grasp it, it will flow away. We must manage our time and make time for exercise and meditation. Even when I'm exercising, whether I'm walking or riding a horse, I meditate in order to be able to give something to my country and my people. Time is like life. Whatever passes of it never comes back. We must work hard and be diligent. As of tomorrow, you must all remember that the clock is ticking and that every day that passes won't come back. You must manage your time and be organized. There is something else I'd like to say. I'll tell you something that you should know. Success is 50%. The remaining 50% is the failure of your competitors and enemies. Your Highness, is there anything you like to say to conclude this historic and candid session with you? Yes. We wanted a Minister of Youth. And I was with a group of ministers and friends. So I said, I want a minister of a young age. They said, the youth don't have enough experience. I told them no. I want a minister of a young age. I don't want them to have your knowledge and experience. I want them to give us the new ideas of the youth. So, we announced the position and we made calls to universities. We gathered some of the most accomplished young men and women and we formed a small committee to look into them. And thank God, we chose Shemma and Mazrui.
I'm happy to have Shema in the cabinet. What she did was that she formed youth councils in every emirate. She gathered all the young people and said, we want to hear your opinion. Moreover, we have 2,500 students studying in universities abroad. So she called them, heard their opinions, and divided them into work teams. And they are working with her today. Today, Shamma al Mazrui leads the biggest ministry in the UAE with the it's even the biggest ministry in the world. Thank you, Your Highness, for this historic chance to have a candid dialogue with you, and we truly hope that this dialogue will be the beginning to resuming Arab civilization and to keep pushing it forward. Thank you, Your Highness, for this chance to meet you. It's a great honor for me. Thank you all for your attendance.